are we doing? based on a live setting in, in the chamber. Uh, all right, open up the heavens. You all good? Mm -hmm. Did I show another big tempo? Did I? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I can tend to be too something, slow or fast. Have we set up the live stream? Uh, on Rock of Ages, I'm going to start that the first time. Blessed assurance. We good? Yeah. Okay. What y'all do again?
everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Nashville, Georgia. The antivirus is on its way. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Good morning. Hello. Hello, good morning. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's as high as I can count. All right, we good? Five more seconds, four more seconds, three more seconds, two more seconds, one more seconds. Man of his word.
Welcome to Sunday morning. What a beautiful day God has given us. We, hate, we can't meet in person, but it doesn't matter. God has spread all across this country and all across our county and our state today as we worship him together. Welcome to First Baptist Nashville uh, as we stream our online service. Appreciate these guys being here for us to lead in worship. Wherever you're at today, God is in control and he's going to get us through this. But none of that matters for these moments. All that matters these moments is that he is God. And he's going to open up the heavens and let us worship him right now. We're going to begin with a great song called Open Up the Heavens. our prayer this morning for us. It's a prayer for you. Wherever you are and whatever's going on, God's going to open up the heavens. He has shown himself. He will continue to show himself. Even in this time, he is our rock. I love this song. It's called Rock of Ages.
Father God, we thank you. We thank you today for technology that we can reach out and we can be together. It gives us a little glimpse of our relationship with you. And as your spirit comes down, it dwells within us, it walks with us, it guides us, it directs us. It picks us up. It gives us hope. It gives us joy. We can ride down the road and worship you. You've used this time in our life to teach us, to mold us, to shape us, to draw us closer to you. You've used this time to shake us. To shake the very foundation of normalcy in our life. And God, there's people watching. There's people worshiping. Singing praise to you. Whose tomorrow is very uncertain. The stresses of life are many times bad enough, but God, right now, for some, it's unbearable apart from you Father we thank you for your love we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your grace and right now we thank you for your provision we thank you for the technology and the skills that you put in the hands of our medical people the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers the volunteers that are striving to keep us safe striving to Provide what we need in order for you to come and heal the bodies. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for everybody in our society, our government officials, the essential personnel that's having to get up and go to work and be on the front lines. God, we thank you for that. And yet we're still in uncertain times. you remind us even now there are some things that are not uncertain you're God and you've got the power and the strength to walk us through it you're God and you've got the power and strength to draw us to you and save us from a life of sin you can save us from that depression that may sit in Restore our hope. Restore our faith. This morning we love you. This morning we worship you. This morning we proclaim to anybody that will listen. But most importantly to you. You are our assurance. Nothing can shake the foundation. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. Thank you.
Thank you, Scott, and praise team uh, for leading us in worship this morning. What a beautiful, beautiful sound. And also want to especially thank those behind the scenes that are helping us with the technology side of things. And uh, also for those that are listening by the conference call. Welcome, and uh, we want to thank those who have made the conference call possible as well. We're trying to make as many ways possible uh, for you to tune in uh, live and uh, listen and participate in the worship. Uh, as we cannot meet in person, at least we can meet in spirit. If you have your Bibles, wherever you're listening from, if you would please open to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to be in chapter 11, beginning somewhere around verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. And while you're turning there, let me uh, begin reading. In fact, I'm going to begin reading in verse 23 this morning. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Then when he, he being Barnabas... Then when he, Barnabas, arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. If you've ever wondered where we have gotten the title Christian from, followers of Jesus were first known as Christians there in the New Testament in the city of Antioch. Today I want to talk to you. In fact, the sermon titles, Encouragement, Be a Barnabas. Encouragement, Be a Barnabas. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. And even though we're not able to be together, Lord, we are bonded by the Spirit of God. And Father God, we pray for all those who are hearing this, that you will speak to the needs in their lives, Lord, that you will minister them in the ways that they need. And Lord, we thank you for your word, the power that it has to first bring us to salvation and then afterwards to continue to mold us and shape us to be more and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today I do want us to spend a little bit of time on encouragement. Last week we talked about fear, how God has not given us a spirit of fear. And even though this crisis is all around us, we are not to be people of fear. Well, today I want to kind of look at the opposite of that and talk about encouragement, how we need encouragement And at the same time, we as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be encouragers. Last week, I I got this little card in the mail, and it it, it so brightened my day. And and in fact, let me read to you. It was an anonymous card, no return address, no one signed it, but it simply said this inside. "I, I know as a pastor, you are not immune to the struggles of life. You know, that's very true. As a pastor doesn't mean I don't have the same struggles that everyone else does. And then it went on to say, take courage that, listen, I am praying for your strength and knowledge every morning. Every morning I have someone, I don't know who they are, but they're praying on my behalf. I want you to know that that encouraged me, that lifted me up. You know, hardly a week goes by where I don't get a text or an email or a kind word or a phone call saying, preacher, we're praying for you. Or pastor, how can I pray for you? Or hang in there or thank you for your leadership. I want you to know encouragement means the world to me. And I would imagine would mean the world to you as well. You know, we have a a society that is desperate to hear encouragement from one another. Well, today we find ourselves in a very strange and difficult times that have been caused by something that can only be seen under a microscope called COVID-19 or coronavirus or 
the many, one of the many names that you know it by. But it's also given us an opportunity as followers of Jesus Christ to be a Barnabas, to be an encourager, to bring encouragement to a world that's in crisis, that's in chaos, that's in panic. You know, these are the times that we all need encouragement and we need to be encouragers. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we're filled with the Spirit of God and dwelt with the Spirit of God and given the power so that we can be encouragers to a lost world and to brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, as I said, today's message, I want to help all of us to be encouragers by looking at Barnabas, by the way, if you go back to Acts chapter 4, his original name is Joseph. Because he was such an encourager, they changed his name to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Isn't that amazing? He was such an encourager that the apostles saw fit to change his name so that it matched his lifestyle. I wonder what you and I, what, <laughs> what our names would be changed to if we were to have a name that matched our lifestyle. Well, as we get into Acts chapter 11, as we get into the text, I want to make sure that we have the context of this passage. So look back at verse 19. Look up just a couple of verses from where we started. Verse 19 in Acts chapter 11, and I'll begin reading there. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the, lur, the word to no one except to the Jews alone. God, what, what man used for evil, God turned in for good. The Christians came under tremendous persecution, and because of that persecution they had to flee. And what that did is it literally spread the gospel throughout the rest of the known world world. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't waste any time. They showed up, moved in, and then they got busy sharing the good news of the gospel. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was then with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Now, Warren Wearsby, those in my congregation know that Warren Wearsby is absolutely my favorite preacher and commentator. He, he kind of gives us a little introduction here to this passage. He says, when the saints were scattered abroad during Saul's persecution of the church, and you can go back to Acts chapter 8 and read a little more background information about that. Some of them ended up in Antioch, the capital of Syria, 300 miles from Jerusalem. 300 miles where they started from. That's how far the persecution had driven them. With a population of a half a million, so this was certainly not a small, tiny little bump in the road, Antioch ranked as the third largest city in the Roman Empire following Rome and Alexandria. Antioch was a wicked city perhaps second only to Corinth. And we've looked at Corinth in the past and all the deities and the perverse religious uh, affiliation with those deities, just the wickedness and the sinfulness that, per per that was a part of that city. And uh, the same was true of Antioch. But here's how those exiled Christians looked at it. They didn't look at it as a negative. They said, okay, this is a positive in the fact, okay, we have a, a target-rich environment to be evangelist for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they arrived there in Antioch, talking about the persecuted believers, the word of God was on their lips and the hand of God was on their witness. And it says that a great number of sinners repented and believed. Imagine that, going to this wicked city. I don't know about you, I, I might want to be hunkering down, hiding because of the persecution, but that's not how they acted. They did the exact opposite. They hit the streets, they built relationships, they 
witnessed for the Lord Jesus Christ. The church leaders in Jerusalem had a responsibility to shepherd this scattered flock, which now included Gentile congregations as far away as Syria. Remember, they had spread many hundreds of miles. Apparently, and we don't know exactly why, but apparently the apostles were ministering away from Jerusalem at the time, so the elders commissioned Barnabas, a.k.a. son of encouragement, to go to Antioch to find out what was going on amongst the Gentiles. Now, chapter 11 is not the first time that we uh, have glimpses of Barnabas. If you go over, uh, in fact, the first time we hear Barnabas is in Acts chapter 4, when persecution arose in the church in Jerusalem, listen to what Barnabas did. Barnabas sold his land and gave it to the church to be distributed to help other believers in distress. You see, Barnabas had a generous heart. You could say he, uh, he put his money where his heart was. He just didn't say, well, uh, those poor people, I, I hate it for them. He went and sold his property and gave that. To those Christians to help them out. Next he appears in Acts chapter 9. And again, I encourage you to go back and, and read a little bit more about Barnabas. What a wonderful story. But he appears in Acts 9 when Saul was converted. Remember, Saul was a persecutor of the church. Now, thankfully, he had that Damascus Road experience Jesus Christ saved him and changed him like he does everyone. And when he did that, Saul became a Paul. And Paul became, in my opinion, other than Jesus Christ, the greatest Christian to walk this earth, certainly within the New Testament. I realize that's arguable. But Barnabas stepped forward. You see, nobody else... Would, would have anything to do with Saul. No other Christians would have anything to do with Saul because they, were, they knew of his past and they were suspect of his, uh, did he really have a change or was this some kind of trick? But Barnabas, he believed it was real and he took Paul and he took them to Jerusalem and introduced him to the other believers and we know that was a crucial step in, Spall, in, in Saul's spiritual development. Barnabas played a key role in Saul becoming the Paul that you and I know about. Well, that's an introduction. Now let's, let's get to the meat of the sermon, so to speak. Chapter 11, we've already looked at bits in 4 and 8 and 9. But chapter 11 tells us why Barnabas had such an effective ministry. And I believe by looking at his life today, it's going to help us understand how better to live and how better to be an encouragement. First of all, uh, there's four points. The first point is the testimony of Barnabas. I want us to look at the testimony of Barnabas. If you go back to verse 24, it says that he, Barnabas was a good man. He, Barnabas, was a good man. Now, now let me make this very clear. I feel like I need to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Barnabas was not saved by being a good man. He was a good man because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, I know that non-believers can be good people, but I just want to make sure that everyone knows that this, this verse is not saying that you can become a Christian by just being a good person. Christianity only comes through faith in Jesus Christ when he forgives us of our sins and becomes Lord and Savior of our life. But it does say that he was a good man. Now, I believe one of the keys to Barnabas' success was a word, unfortunately, is found lacking in most of our society today, and may I say even in our churches, but it's integrity. Barnabas was a man of an integrity. And by the way, that's something that every follower of Jesus Christ needs to keep in mind and needs to strive to be as a person of integrity. 
a gentleman by the name of Chuck Sly. He's a pastor, and I, doing my research for this sermon, I ran across a, a sermon that he did. In fact, kind of, it just matched what I was wanting to say, so I, I read it, and I'm sure that some of his thoughts have ended up in my sermon just, just the way it is. But specifically, he said this. In order to really make a difference in people's lives spiritually, you must have integrity in your life to back up what you confess with your lips. Boy, that is so true. The saying we used to say, and I guess it's still out there someone, somewhere, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Listen, People don't really give a rip what comes out of your mouth. What they're looking for is how you live your life. You see, hypocrisy will ruin a believer's testimony, will ruin a believer's spiritual impact quicker than anything else. You see, there's a such thing as Sunday morning only Christians. In other words, you come to church on Sunday morning and you live one way, in the other six days a week, you live far different than what you represent on Sunday morning. You see, Barnabas wasn't like that. He was a man that had high integrity. He was not a hypocrite. He lived a life. It says he was a good man. He was a saved man. He was the kind of man that if you called him, he was there to help you. The world expects Christians to be different. And if they aren't rightly or wrongly, whether that's right or wrong, whether it's fair or unfair, they judge you by the consistency of your life to the faith you espouse. And that is so true. By the way, our children and our teenagers in our own homes are looking at the same thing. Parents, are you going to live like you tell them they should live? Is that fair? Well, I'm not going to worry about fair or not, but I can tell you that that statement is true. Now, we're not perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to live sinless lives. It doesn't mean we're going to make mistakes. But after we sin, after we make mistakes, in what we do then, that's where the difference Lies. Barnabas had a good testimony with believers and non-believers alike. Well, we looked at the testimony of Barnabas. Secondly, the spiritual condition of Barnabas. The spiritual condition of Barnabas. If you go back to verse 24 again, it says, Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Of faith. You see, Barnabas operated by, not out of his own power, but he operated out of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that phrase there, full of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Well, it means being spirit controlled or being yielded to the Spirit. In other words, not what we want, but Lord, what do you want? God, lead me in my life each and every day. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul commands to be filled with the Spirit. All believers are to be filled with the Spirit. And if you look at the verb tense there, it's something called present imperative. And it means that we're to, uh, it, it's something we must do over and over and over again. Now, at the moment of salvation, we're indwelt with the Spirit of God. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's when the Holy Spirit resides within us. And He's there until the Lord Jesus calls us home and uh, we go to be with Him in heaven. He never leaves us. But there is a difference between the baptism of, Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, which takes place at the moment of salvation, and the filling of the Holy Spirit, again, Paul commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you look at the tense of the verb, we're to do that every day, every day, day after day after day. How do we do that? Well, we simply wake up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus Christ, 
not my will, but your will. Spirit of God, give me the power to live according to the commandments of your word. Lord Jesus, fill me so that I can be a witness for you. Barnabas was not only filled with the Holy Spirit, it says he was filled with faith. He was filled with faith. Faith is believing God even if you cannot understand why. Faith is believing God even when you can't understand why. You know, I've heard people ask the question on uh, talk radio shows, and people have asked me, and I've seen it in different articles and readings, why is God allowed the coronavirus? Why would he do this to us? Well, you know, I don't know that he's done this to us. Now, ultimately, in God's sovereignty, he has allowed it. But understand, when man fell, sin entered the world, COVID, uh, things like diseases like COVID-19 were able to be formed in our world. In essence, we are seeing the result of sin that has entered humanity. Could God stop it? Yes. And I believe he is as he works through people who he is given the intelligence and the ability to work and find a cure, find a vaccine for this. But even when we don't understand why things happen, we must remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, listen to this. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Man, you want to you wanna please God, then live by faith. Faith according to his word. I think of a good illustration of faith is tithing. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, there was a very specific, specific system of uh, almost a tax, if you will. In the New Testament, there's no specific number, uh, but, but as I tell our people all the time, why would you want to do less under grace than the people did under the law in the Old Testament? So uh, we are to give generously, we're to give uh, freely, uh, and we're to give abundantly to the Lord. Now listen, the Bible says that we are going to be blessed when we tithe. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have extra, extra dollars show up in your bank account. It doesn't mean that your life is just going to be rosy without any problems. But I believe by faith what the Bible says is that if I'm faithful to God with my tithing, that he in turn is going to bless me. And it's probably ways that I'll, I won't even know until I get to heaven one day. But I believe tithing is faith. We, we believers today need to be like Barnabas. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we need to be full of faith. The third thing, the third point, the service of Barnabas. The service of Barnabas. Look at verse 23. Then when he, Barnabas, arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Two things. First of all, Barnabas urged them, the church, to be steadfast believers. To be steadfast believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That means stay to it. Don't let the circumstances change how you believe and how you act. Don't let it change your faith. Don't let the circumstances control who you are. No matter what we're going through, whether it's a, a pandemic or anything else that pops up into our lives, we are to remain faithful. We're to remain steadfast. I love that word, immovable. We're not even to move against the things of God. Back at the beginning of 
Desert Storm in 1991, I heard a report that uh, President Bush was having a conversation with Margaret Thatcher, uh, then the Prime Minister of uh, Britain. And, and Bush was beginning to kind of wonder a little bit, well, are we doing the right thing? Is, is, is this the right response? Are, are things going to go okay? And Margaret Thatcher, who is someone I have great respect for, Margaret Thatcher said, now, uh, George, don't go all wobbly on me. Well, that's kind of what uh, uh, Barnabas is saying to the believers. Listen, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Don't go wobbly. Stay steadfast, immovable, remain faithful to what God has called us to. But then secondly, Barnabas helped them, again the church, to look to Jesus and live in close fellowship with the Lord and with one another. There in verse 23 it says, remain true to the Lord. Remain true to the Lord. In these trying times, we can help other believers to remain steadfast and true to the Lord Jesus Christ. How? By being encouragers. Being encouragers. A phone call, checking on somebody. An email, a, a little note like I got in the mail. Sunday school teachers checking on their students and just covering the bases, making sure everyone's okay, providing that encouragement, letting folks know that they're not alone as we go through this time of crisis together. Well, the fourth and final thing I want us to see about uh, Barnabas's ministry, why it was so successful, is the ministry of Barnabas. Again, look there in verse 24, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, moving into this wicked, wicked city. Barnabas, along with those other believers, as he encouraged them, they remained faithful to go and to share the good news of the gospel. And it says that the Lord blessed them, and there were many who were saved. Let me, let me close with this this morning. Our church needs believers to be like Barnabas. Our church needs to be believers to be like Barnabas. Encourage others, especially other believers. We, we live in crazy times. Nobody really knows when this thing's going to come to fruition and move out of the way and we return to normal. I think for most of us, it's, it's, it's showing that it's going to be longer than we originally thought. Even though we can't meet together, my goal, my prayer, is that every believer will continue to be an encourager for the Lord to other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, one of the great concerns is as we get through this crisis is the toll that it's going to have on people emotionally, mentally, psychologically. People in isolation, people alone, people feeling like the walls are caving in. And one of the ways that we can help combat that now is by being and encourage her. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the life of Barnabas. We thank you that he has demonstrated what encouragement means and what it and, 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 and the effect that it has on those around us. I pray, Lord, that you'll help our church to be an encouragement to this community, especially during this time of crisis. Father God, you know the needs of those that are listening. We pray, Lord, that you'll meet those needs, bless them, and Lord, for those who might be lost, who are listening to this, understand that a relationship with Jesus Christ awaits for them if they'll call on the name of the Lord, confess their sin, repent, and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Well, listen, if there's anything that we can help you with, I encourage you to call our church office. You can go to our website and uh, get that number if you don't have it. But if there's anything that we can do, call us and we'll do our best to do that. God bless you. Have a great day.